Hi, I'm Dr. Steven Snyder, the author of Love Worth Making, How to Have Ridiculously Great Sex in a Long-Lasting Relationship. And you're watching Mr. Media. I'm Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You can see, hear, and read more than a thousand of my previous celebrity interviews at mrmedia.com. That's mrmedia.com. Subscribe to the show at YouTube, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Alexa Podcasts, or Stitcher, and follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Oh, and if you like the show, please tell the world with a five-star review on uh, Apple, Apple Podcasts or iTunes. On today's show, I'll talk to sex and couples therapist Dr. Steven Snyder, author of a new book, Love Worth Making, How to Have Ridiculously Great Sex in a Long-Lasting Relationship. Stick around. Imagine Oprah as a sex therapist. You get an orgasm, you get an orgasm, and you get an orgasm. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's never that easy, is it? As we get older and our partnerships endure, sex isn't as simple and automatic as it was when we were young and set on round-the-clock frisky. My guest today, Dr. Steven Snyder, is a New York sex and couples therapist, psychiatrist, and author of a new book, Love Worth Making. How to Have Ridiculously Great Sex in a Long-Lasting Relationship. In it, Dr. Snyder shares real-life tales of men and women whose sex lives have hit bumps in the road, and he tells how he helped them resolve a wide variety of challenges and complications. The book is more about emotional positions than physical ones, so don't expect a lot of talk about twisting yourself and your lover into pretzels. If that's what you're looking for, Check the Mr. Media archives for earlier interviews with the host of the Sex with Emily podcast. Dr. Steven Snyder, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you so, so much. Uh, good to have you here. And uh, Dr. Snyder, i got to ask you right at the top, where do we all go wrong in terms of uh, sex and long-term relationships? Are there any commonalities? Well, I think the commonality is that nobody has a smooth course when it comes to sex and long-term relationships. Sex isn't really designed for long-term relationships. So what we do is we adapt to it. We lose desire, we find it again, we lose it, we fire it again, and in the meantime, we try not to panic and stay calm about the whole thing. Why, it was interesting what you said there, uh, that sex is not really geared for long-term relationships. How do you mean that? Well. There's something called limerence, L-I-M-E-R-E-N-C-E in sex therapy, which is that magic feeling. You get that magic uh, new relationship energy the first uh, 12 to 18 months of a relationship where you're having sex all the time, partly for the pleasure of it, partly because it's new and excited, and partly because you really, really need the reassurances that everything's going to be okay. After 12 or 18 months, you figure, okay, things are all right, and you just don't get that magic dust anymore. It's just not there. Well, Most sex books tell you to try and how to recapture that, to do something new and exciting, to pretend or dress up or whatever. And my experience is those things just don't work. They just get you frustrated because your drawer is full of sex toys and you're still feeling a little bored. So the way I suggest is that couples get into it more from a mindfulness perspective. It's not so much sizzling as simmering. Hmm. And you just want to maintain just a simmer of erotic energy all the time in your relationship. Well, and you know what drew me uh, to your book, in a sea of, of books about sex, uh, frankly. An ocean. An ocean. Uh, <clears throat> was the focus on, <coughs> excuse me, on long-lasting relationships. Uh, and, and I mean, as a guy who is uh, uh, approaching his 30th year of marriage, uh, that kind of, I suspect it's an underserved uh, market segment. Absolutely. Most sex books uh, that talk about marriage talk about it in purely emotional terms, they don't have any sex in it, or they talk about it in purely sexual terms with no emotions in it. I tried to kind of put the two together. What some of the did wrong that uh, you know, long-term relationships take? The most biggest mistake that couples make is they make a divide. I have sex, which for most American couples is like about once a week, and when we're not going to have sex, and when it's in that not going to have sex time, they don't really get excited together. Hmm. They don't bother to get aroused because they think if I'm aroused, we're going to be having sex. So they'll sit on the couch with their arms around each other, but they don't really feel each other up. They don't really get into breathing together, inhaling each other's scent, 
or enjoying all those uh, appetizer kind of things, which if you enjoy all week long, it makes sex on the weekend a lot better. It's the buildup. Well, it's not only the buildup, but it's the erotic climate in the relationship. A lot of couples have this kind of toggle. It's either off or just every once in a while you turn it on, but you can't really keep a sexual relationship going like that. Um, you really just need something in between. So what I suggest is couples do what we call kind of simmer, which is a minute or two, just like teenagers between classes, mm. where they just get excited and then just uh, go off to work or get excited and then just fall asleep. You're not going to have sex all the time, but you are going to get excited a lot. Hmm. Is it it's uh, different than most couples do it. That's well, number one. Okay, go ahead. Number two is they get too focused on orgasms because they want to both have an orgasm so they can get to sleep or they want to both have an orgasm so they both feel they did an adequate job and they were considerate. Everybody wants to be a considerate lover these days. That's problem number three, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But the orgasm focus really gives people a problem because it'd be like going out to eat and just trying to figure out what's for dessert. You can have it, you get the check and you go home and you're still hungry. The orgasm isn't really what nourishes you long term in a sexual relationship. It's really that uh, arousal that you get where you're really kind of losing IQ points together for a while and getting dumb and happy. That's what creates the really, really good memories and a sense basis to keep you having sex. And then the third problem is people try and be too generous. Everybody's taught today is the six moves to drive your partner wild in bed and how to be a generous lover and all the guys, they want to figure out exactly how to stroke it right so she'll like it. And in the process, we've lost passion. So the third mistake people make is they forget that they're supposed to enjoy it. They're not just supposed to do it right. That reminds me of a famous uh, sex therapist once wrote, uh, what's, the, uh, what, what's a two-year-old's favorite word? <laughs> Thank you for calling me a favorite sex therapist. Um, yeah, the favorite word is mine. Right. And that's all anybody knows. They want to know what's in it for me. Exactly. The W-I-I-F-M. That's really what it's about in sex. Well, you, you're That's erotic. Passion is erotic. Generosity is nice, but it's not erotic. And that's, I, th I thought that was really interesting in reading, is that, you, you know, you, you talk about that it's not, it's not, you know, there's all the talk about pleasing your partner, but, but, but you got to be a little bit selfish, is, I think, is part of your message here. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a very famous uh, story from the, uh, the Talmud, a rabbinic story of a rabbi who goes under the bed of his teacher to figure out what's the best way to make love. You know the story? No. <laughs> it's a great story. It's a great story. The rabbi under the bed. Great story. And he's listening and listening and listening as his teacher and master is having sex with his wife. And finally, he can't control himself anymore. He goes, he goes, Master, you're, you're behaving so different. You're, you're behaving like, 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 a, like a child who's never tasted this kind of thing before. And the rabbi goes, who's under my bed? <laughs> he, says, he, says, he says, God, and the guy's name is this is not normal. He says, no, I must learn. You're my master and I must learn. And he really put his finger on the secret. You're like a two-year-old. You've never tasted this kind of stuff before. In other words, this ordinarily very serious master is having a good time. The guy was thunderstruck by it. That's the secret is to have a good time. Mm -hmm. You want to be like a two-year-old in bed. But it's interesting, though. I mean, most of us cannot picture the other person, the neighbor or the boss, having sex. So it's 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 it's, it's interesting the way you describe that the, the the student is under the bed. And it's like this this can't be you. You can't. He, he wants to learn, yeah. Because when we're having sex, um, I don't know this from personal experience because I've never really observed anybody uh, having sex either. Um, but uh, we're just not our usual selves. That's a key thing in the book. You're not going to be your usual self. If you feel like your usual self during sex, you may, be, may not be doing it the best way. Hmm. Never, you, you, sex therapist, you've never observed uh, another couple, not in a, like a, a clinical uh, setting at all? Yeah, I mean, they show movies and everything. Yeah. But it's, it's you, know, you know, the thing about movies, it's all about camera angles. You don't really get the real thing. Hmm. I, I, uh, it's, I hadn't thought about this in a while, but I remember in... Uh, in college, I had a human sexuality class, and they showed a lot of, a lot of film from Masters and Johnsons. I think uh, Masters wow. and Johnson, and uh, you, you see couples of all ages, and, and uh, you're observing them. It was just it's absolutely fascinating, and uh, yeah. so that's why I asked. And also the the series that was on Showtime for several years, Masters of Sex. It was interesting how they documented how they learned to watch couples, and then of course they became one of the couples that they were. Exactly. 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 Anyway, but Orson Welles 
is famous for saying there were two things you really can't bring convincingly to screen. One is prayer and the other is sex. Hmm. I don't know exactly what he meant by that, but that's what he said. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, now, in one section of the book, uh, you, you help a couple uh, by telling them about rat sex. Uh, oh, absolutely. Rat sex is extremely important, especially rat foreplay. It's the most important of rat sex. Um, what happens is the female rat goes in front of the male rat, kind of wiggles around a little bit, and then darts away from him. And if all goes well, he chases after her. And they run around around the cage very, very fast. He chases her as fast as he can until he's completely exhausted. And if she decides that he's chased her well enough, she lets him have her. And that's what they do. And they show this, uh, my colleague Jim Faust uh, at Concordia in Canada, they show this these movies at sex therapist conventions and all the sex therapists go up and yes, yes, that's exactly it. That's how it's done. Um, most sex therapists are women and most women know that that's really, really what it's about is getting that rat to chase you because they really enjoy being chased. And the idea is that the female rats, they, okay, they may be okay with the sex, but getting that rat to chase around after you, that makes them feel very, very, very valued. And you apply that, you apply that to a couple who are very surprised by this, but Absolutely, because guys don't often understand that. They don't understand that for a woman, orgasms are nice, but for most women, what's even better is to feel like the man really, really, really is thinking about you, even when you're not there, wants you, is hungry for you, values you, and really finds you, and here's the key word, irresistible. It's a little bit different in a long-term relationship because... Uh, how could you have a chase if you already have the person? Or to right. quote my colleague Esther Perel, how can you desire what you already have? So uh, that's a tricky one. So as a guy, you have to just keep in mind that uh, she still might like to be chased around every once in a while. I actually, that's interesting because I actually found that that was something uh, that I kind of learned after so many years of marriage. That it did, it's not something that you're immediately aware of because it's so easy at first. And then exactly. there's, there's kind of a period of slowing down, and then it, maybe there's a lull, and then you come back to it, and you kind of realize that, oh, that's, that's, what, you, that's what was needed, that's what you wanted. I th- I thought it was a very interesting lesson that you taught this couple, and uh, you know, it was something that I've kind of come across myself and, you know, after being... Oh, well, I'm glad to get validation for that. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the methods in this book have been used in over 1,500 patients. Mm-hmm. Um, so they are uh, office tested and uh, presumably bedroom tested. The truth. So, <laughs> Well, one thing about that you, is, you know, there are a lot of books on uh, uh, sexuality and, and you know, sex therapy, uh, couples therapy. Um, but I've, I've always thought that if you were to sit down and want to write one, uh, from, from your perspective, I'm thinking... You would have to believe that you have some experience or some knowledge to share that your colleagues uh, are missing or that you find that your patients are just not getting from other sources. Uh, do you want to, can you maybe highlight a couple of the keys that are here? It isn't a question of believing uh, that there's something that wasn't there. I know because I've, I've read them all. You know, I always say I've read all these sex books so you don't have to. I read, I know it's not there. And I think the reason it's not there is it's not a simple matter to come up with the right vocabulary to describe erotic feelings. So very few people really describe erotic feelings. What I talk about in my book, and it's right at the beginning, so I'm not really spoiling much that you can't already find on the Amazon teaser page, um, but the hallmarks of erotic feelings for most people, number one is you're losing IQ points you're becoming a little bit dumb and happy. You don't have all your faculties intact. It's like you get a little enchanted and hypnotized. And most people remember this. They can remember the greatest sex of their life. They kind of lost track of time and they didn't remember. Uh, I actually learned this when I was 16 years old. Um, I was with my girlfriend. This is PG, don't worry. Um, okay. I was with my girlfriend and we were, I don't know, hugging and kissing or something. And I was supposed to pick up my brother from school that afternoon. And I forgot completely to pick him up. And I was a pretty responsible kid, you know, future pre-medical student and everything. And so I thought to myself, all right, something happened here. Something happened here. And it wasn't until years later that I realized I was aroused. That's what happened. People get stupid and irresponsible when they're aroused. So number one is people lose mental faculties. Mm. Number two is that 
you become more childish. You become more demanding, more selfish. This is told the whole generosity thing doesn't really work. You're with your partner, you may be extremely into them, but you don't really want to hear about their day. You know, you don't really want to about their problems. You just want to make mic noises and tell you that you're wonderful. Yeah. So we become a little bit more childish. It's a regression to an infantile state. Okay. And associated with that, number three, it's validating. You have a feeling of, yeah, 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 this is where I really live. You, you've, you've brought me home, you know, to your partner. you brought me home to where I really, really live. Yeah, this is the essence of me. People feel as their most valuable essence. And those three things together is a very, very powerful experience if you can get all that going together. Hmm. That's incidentally the reason that if you're gay, sex with the opposite gender doesn't work so well. I've talked to a lot of gay people who say, yeah, it'll work. I mean, you know, I can get hard or wet. I can get excited. I can have an orgasm. But I don't have that feeling of, yeah, 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 that's me. That's really where I live. Hmm. I'm I'm curious about something you said a minute ago. Uh, you were talking about when you were 16, and yeah, you know, we can we can go back there if you want. Yeah, I'm, I'm, what I'm curious, and not so much your your I got nothing your, to hide. Yeah. Not, not so much your teen sexual experience, although if you want to tell us, go right ahead. But I was thinking in terms of when when do you decide? I, I, you kind of indicated that at that point you you were thinking pre med, but when yeah. do you decide? To, and and you you became a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, Absolutely. and your sex therapist. So when do you decide to follow uh, the trail of crumb, the breadcrumbs to sex therapy as opposed to uh, urology or gynecology question. or something else? It's a great question. Um, I uh, became a psychiatrist just because I, I like to talk to people. I'm a kind of a talking psychiatrist rather than a pill psychiatrist. Hmm. People are usually relieved to find out when, when, they, when I speak to them. And then within psychiatry, I noticed that sexual problems were causing a tremendous amount of misery for people and very few people knew what to do with them. So I thought to myself, you know, that's an area that really you can make a real contribution. And I saw how grateful people were if you could help them with sexual problems. I don't know if you saw the original movie MASH sure. that the TV series was based on. The, you know, the, the song Suicide is Painless, which was the original soundtrack to MASH. Painless was the dentist on the unit. Right. And he came to Hawkeye one day and he said, you got to help me kill myself because I have erectile dysfunction. They didn't call it that, but that's what it was. And so they have to come up with some kind of a treatment for this guy because he's really desperate. And occasionally you do have young men come in and say, I can't live like this. It's a horrible, horrible pain. So the fact that these people were in horrible pain, people with sexual problems, and that there was presumably help available, but nobody really knew how to do it. I thought to myself, no, there's a challenge I like. Um, I, you, you mentioned earlier that um, I guess people are always wondering what's the you know what's what's a good per, a good frequency for having sex uh, yeah. in a week and you know you said you know once or whatever but so that's a that's a real common question I know that absolutely what I'm wondering is what are the more uncommon questions that you deal with in your practice yeah one com one uh, is uh, what do I do if my uh, husband's penis is too large. Oh, yeah, um, and that's a, that's a, that's a big one, um, so to speak. Um, <laughs> Pun intended. Okay, it's un unintended. Uh, and uh, there was actually just an article in the New York Times this morning about that uh, by a gynecologist who said, you know, this this really just very very rarely happens. It usually just means that the woman's feeling guarded uh, and tense, and those muscles can't relax enough. Um, so that's a that's a uh, kind of an off-the-beat question. Um, the other off-the-beat questions tend to have to do with atypical sexualities, because a lot of people do have atypical sexualities. That's a little bit more recognized now than it was 30 years ago when I started off in practice. Um, mostly guys who have atypical sexualities who get turned on by unusual things, and I'm not going to get into the details because of patient confidentiality, mm -hmm. um, but you never really know what turns somebody on and what doesn't. Are, are, it's really a person's individual fingerprint. Are patients surprised sometimes to find out that what they thought was so unusual was not that unusual? They like that a lot, usually. You know, they say, I, you know, get turned down, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, yeah, I've seen that a lot. <laughs> and they like hearing that? I would think they'd be disappointed. They're like, they'd no, be thinking no, that I've no, had that to myself. No, they're, 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 they're happy about that. Because, they, you know, they, and also I think patients appreciate that 
nothing they say is going to shock me because it means they're not that unusual. We all have more in common than, than, than otherwise. As a matter of fact, most people who are in therapy don't talk about their sexual problems with their therapist because the therapist has indicated in some kind of subtle way that they don't feel entirely equipped to deal with those problems on a professional level. Hmm. So in the early days before I was known as a sex therapist, I would have patients come in to see me to talk about something else. And I'd say, you know, by, after a while, it came up somehow in conversation. You know, I, I'm also a sex therapist. And they go, oh, well, then let me tell you about this. And they never bothered to tell me about it before. Interesting. I call it the accidental sex therapist. So there's always those accidental sex therapy moments where the person says, yeah, I never thought I'd be able to tell this person about this. Because hmm. everybody's got something. That sounds like the title for your follow-up book. The accidental sex therapist. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it could could be fiction too. It might be even better as fiction. Um, well, actually, just to clarify, all of the stories in the book are essentially fiction because it's it's, it's unethical really to talk about patients. I don't need patients. They're all just uh, what do they call it? Composites of of hundreds and hundreds of patients. They're essentially essentially fictionalized. Okay, so you didn't go to your files and say, "Let me tell the story about That's Bob Andel." No, I can't can't do that. As a matter of fact, the ethics of it have evolved over the last couple of decades. It used to be felt to be ethical to ask a patient's permission mm -hmm. to publish their story, and now people think, you know, we kind of worry about that because did the patient really feel free to give permission or to withhold permission? Mm -hmm. Were they worried about offending you or disappointing you? So the 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 way the standard in medical publishing these days for the kind of thing I do is that whoever story might have gone into it is so disguised that they themselves wouldn't recognize it. Hmm. Okay. Well, That's I, I'm curious. Uh, earlier you, uh, you quoted Esther uh, Perel. Sure. And uh, interestingly, I had, uh, I had actually grabbed uh, another quote that you had from her, and I wanted to ask you about this. Uh, you know, in this era of uh, the Me Too and the Time's Up uh, movement, yes. Uh, you, this is the quote you have from Esther. Uh, Most of us get turned on at night by the very things that we'll demonstrate against during the day. Um, and, and now, obviously, I, I know how books work. You, you, you probably finished writing this book uh, six months, a year ago. Uh, so, you know, you had no idea that these movements were going to go on. But it, at this moment in time, that yeah. quote seems a little bit awkward, uh, probably it's to some women. It's extremely awkward. Yeah, it's okay, we're agreed, right? It's extremely awkward. It's the fact that I was hoping you wouldn't ask me about that. Sorry. <laughs> um, the quote, just to reiterate, because um, you know, you have to have courage to do this kind of thing, is most of us get turned on at night by things that we demonstrate against during the day. What I meant specifically, and there are a couple of illustrations in the book, are of women who fantasize about being in helpless positions with respect to a man who doesn't care about them and has a tremendous amount of power. Um, essentially, these are masochistic sexual fantasies. That's how they're usually classified. Many, many people, women and men, have masochistic sexual fantasies. And we don't really know what those fantasies are all about. You and I could talk for hours about this. And in the notes at the back of the book, I do talk for a while about the origin of masochistic sexual fantasies. Um, but I really don't know the answer. And I don't think myself or Esther Perel or really anybody knows the answer. All we know is that they exist. But the crucial thing is that that's what you've – what's what your mind has come up in. That's what your mind has come up with as a fantasy. But – by no means would you ever actually want that to happen. Right. So that's the crucial thing in today's day and age. Well, and it's just it's just odd, timely uh, at this time that there's the, we've gone from so many things that have been spoken of privately or never spoken of, and and these yes. things have come out: sexual harassment, uh, you know, uh, these uh, these office uh, sexual situations that are described a little bit by that line, but I, I knew that you and Esther did not mean that situation. But Oh, absolutely. We didn't mean that situation at all. Yeah. As a matter of fact, a woman who has <clears throat> that kind of fantasy is often in the opposite situation in her life. Often she's in the situation with her life with a man who perhaps doesn't manifest some of that dominance. Mm -hmm. So what gets turned on into the, in the dream to encounter with an ultra-dominant man is um, in reality, it could be that the woman is with a guy that she just wishes would behave with a little more selfish passion. 
See, a lot of it has to do with whether a woman has identified a man as being a worthy partner that she really wants. If a woman event, identifies the man as a worthy partner, then they, the sky's the limit in terms of fantasies. They could do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. The problem is when um, the guy wants her, but she hasn't selected him. Then it's traumatic. Mm. What? Um, uh, I'm jumping around a little bit here. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The book, the book covers a, an awful lot of stuff. But I'm, I'm wondering, what's the difference between giving, uh, giving advice as a sex therapist, a couple's uh, therapist, uh, to a couple that is married and has kids – and actively has kids in the house at the time yeah. versus uh, a couple that is not, uh, that's either doesn't have kids, have no plans to have kids, or the kids are up and out of the, the house. I imagine it has to differ because the, situ the, the situations at home are very different. Well, the situations at home are very different. Uh, most couples in Manhattan who have kids, uh, most of them work very hard to keep those kids clothed and fed. Um, most of them are only having sex, to get back to your other question, once a week. That's about typical. Mm -hmm. It's actually gone down in the last couple of decades. Uh, it used to be couples had sex 60-something times a year. Um, and now we know that most people have sex in the 50s. So it's going down 10 points. People worry about that. Mm. But with people with kids, often they're touched out. The kids are touching them all the time. This is in the later part of the book. We, I don't think you got there yet. And so because people are touched out, they're not craving physical touch. Most single or recently coupled people who get together, one of the reasons they have sex is because they're starved for physical touch and they want that touch contact. After you have kids, you don't want the touch contact. You just want to be left alone at the end of the day and have nobody you know, sneeze on you or touch you or hold you. <laughs> the other big thing, though, is that when you make a decision to have kids, for most of us, you make a decision to carry on the mantle of the prevailing culture. So you're in charge of transmitting that the culture's public and private values to your children. Where this comes up most often these days, it's a big subject these days, is monogamy versus non-monogamy. Hmm. A couple without kids, they're free agents. They could do whatever they want. You know, they could go at, down to the resort in Mexico where you could swing. They could uh, have threesomes. They could do whatever they want. And some people do. Mm -hmm. Once you have kids, it's a little dicier. Because, you know, what if somebody finds out? It's, it's a little tricky. Mm. It makes you more conventional when you have kids, or at least makes you have to contend with, with conventionality. The next step is when the kids leave the house. All right. Um, someone once said that the next sexual revolution is going to be led by retirees, and I believe that's so. I can see that. There's a whole literature on this, uh, some interesting books that have come out recently. On, uh, I have a colleague, uh, Viva Wittenberg-Cox from, uh, from England, who wrote a book called Late Love, which has to do with the fact that many people, once they do the work of transmitting the values of their culture to their children, and their children have grown to adulthood, they may decide to end the relationship. They may decide to start over again, especially now people are, are living longer. Um, my book takes the opposite approach. It assumes that you're going to want to continue the relationship for whatever combination of reasons and says, okay, now the kids have left the house. You've got some quiet to yourself. What are you going to do? Hmm. How are you going to cultivate a meaningful, erotic relationship? It's not going to be necessarily a hot relationship, but you want it to be an inspiring relationship. You want for sex to still be a way that you connect and more or less a sacrament, a physical sacrament in your marriage that's meaningful to you and that takes you someplace special. And one of the messages in my book, yeah, you can still do that. I think the thing that my wife and I have learned, and I don't want to get too personal but because that would make her uncomfortable, but I think the thing that we've learned is we're at that point where we've, we've, our kid is, is out of the house, has graduated college. So we've Congratulations. Had, we've, thank you. We've had four years of uh, – quiet in the house and you know you've had to re this is why i found that the topic of the book so interesting we've had to kind of get reacquainted and and yeah become the people that we were before we had a kid and uh, the thing for us has been uh that we laugh a lot more together we you it's know, great and and you know we're not being interrupted all the time by things i mean still getting phone calls from the kid you know i've got this problem You're probably not fighting like as much either no that's uh that's a really good point and i i, I think that's been um uh, it was it was worth enduring uh, right. the years of raising the raising raising my son and everything that we've been through there, both 
with our child, with each other through those years. I think it's made it worth it to get to this point because we're having a lot of fun. I know I have neighbors That's across the street from me uh, who have a, a, a three-year-old, and they waited, as we did, uh, to have a child. They'd been married for a while, and then they had their child. And now, th- now they're looking longingly, longingly at us coming and going the way they used to, going out to yep. dinner often and going to movies, you know. So, I mean, there is, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I think the next sexual revolution will definitely be led by retirees. I hope it's before they get to retirees because I'm not planning to retire for a while. But uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I, I'm I not planning to retire either. Yeah, I'm right. For a better word for it, if I say seniors, that's not exactly it. Post child adults. Maybe post, maybe by empty nesters. Empty nesters. The next yeah. sexual revolution would definitely be led by empty nesters. And that's already happening. The people who talk about embodied sexuality, the people who talk about mindful sexuality, all these meditative processes, tantra. A lot of these people are empty nesters, and they're thinking, "You wait a minute. We're still healthy. We medical advances have allowed us to uh, really be still quite vital, and we still go to the gym. We're still attracted to each other, and as long as we still keep having sex, we're still going to have an erotic connection. Well, why don't we enhance it?" Hmm. I've got one more thing to ask you about, uh, and then we'll, we'll let you go. Um, I had a romance writer or two on the show. Yeah, uh, you know, like more erotic romance, the, like the bodice ripper, a oh, real bodice ripper, real bodice ripper kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, arrow rum. And yeah, and I was asking, I I asked them about uh, romance in the era of Trump. Is it? Yeah. Is, do, do they find now for them the question is? I mean, the the idea of the the rich man pursuing the rich man and that story is yeah. always interesting. But what I'm kind of curious from your perspective is in the last year or so. Uh, a lot of things have changed around us in terms of politics, the environment, things like that, uh, the, the way we are with one another. Um, are you finding people are having more sex because they're feeling maybe kind of desperate about the rest of their lives? Or are they having less sex because they're, they're frightened by the world? Or, or is this a completely irrelevant question? I think there are a couple of questions I would want to mention. Uh, I think people are having less sex. Uh, that's probably not just due to politics. It's probably due to social media and lots of other things that we could talk for a long time about. Uh, people are more plugged in and getting a lot of their narcissistic supplies electronically uh, and from their machines rather than from each other. Hmm. I think there is an interesting transformation, though, that occurred uh, in the last couple of years. And I try and stay away from politics in general, but since you gave me bait, I'm going to jump at it. Um, I think it's probably not irrelevant that during the Obama years, the big bestseller was Fifty Shades of Grey. Hmm. Here you had a post-macho, uh, 21st century masculine man in marriage, uh, a non-abusive, uh, from all we could tell, mild-mannered, uh, well-tempered individual without a trace of scandal. And what's the big blockbuster hit? is somebody who gets with a domineering, controlling, sexual sadist. Now here we are in the Trump administration with somebody who is extremely domineering in all of his activities, and nobody seems to be as turned on by Fifty Shades of Grey anymore. Um, yet one of the things that is true of female sexuality, because most people who read Fifty Shades of Grey are female, other than me, I've read all three volumes, but I just, it's professional for me, is that women tend to like balance. Hmm. So if the balance has shifted one way towards an egalitarian figure, um, and I'm taking that as representative of something of happening in society, then fantasies may go the other way towards being with a dominant figure. Hmm. If the reality is you're confronted by dominant or domineering figure in the public space, Fantasies may go all the other way towards somebody who's more egalitarian. I think we're constantly looking to shift and to, to maintain some kind of an equilibrium between competing forces. Now, that's a little metaphysical, but that's my, that's my feeling about it. That kind of goes back to that quote I read from Esther Perel, isn't it? That the way you are. Exactly. Exactly. Um, that people somehow seek to just rebalance things between their nighttime and their daytime lives. Mm-hmm. And to state the obvious, we're going through tremendous transformation in terms of gender roles and gender expectations. And uh, I think that we've really just begun and nobody really has 
adjusted or re-equilibrated to all the phenomenal changes that have gone on in terms of women in the workplace and uh, women being these days uh, the majority of college students and educated people and going into professions and frequently making more money than their husbands. How do we deal with that in terms of uh, the conventional scripts for power in the bedroom? And I think it's a, just an open question. Nobody has the answer. Hmm. Well, thank you, for, uh, thank you for tackling that. I appreciate that. It was interesting. I did my best. You did. Um, well, folks, listen, uh, you can find Dr. Steven Snyder's new book, Love Worth Making, How to Have Ridiculously Great Sex in a Long-Lasting Relationship, uh, wherever books are sold, or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. That's mrmedia.com. If you are watching uh, this video on the Mr. Media website, if you look below the video, probably over here, maybe over here, you will see, uh, you'll see the cover of the book. You can click on it right now, order it, or download it uh, as, as an e-book. Um, you, know, you know Amazon, they can get it to you via drone within an hour, I understand. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Snyder, you have a uh, website you want to send people to? Um, it's just loveworthmaking.com. Okay. And uh, are you on Twitter or Facebook? So it's love making with the word worth stuck in the middle. <laughs> and people find and you on social I'm media? Twitter at, I'm at sexuality today. All right. It's like psychology today, but just with sexuality. Sexuality today. And in 24 hours, will it be sexuality tomorrow? Sexuality tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, no, it's, right. it's still always sexuality today. All right. Are, are you on Facebook as well? Facebook is Stephen Snyder, MD, but you have to know how to spell my name, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S-N-Y-D-E-R-M-D. Very good. Happy to join you all there. Very good. Uh, well, uh, uh, Dr. Snyder, uh, it, it really is a fascinating book. I, I, I really recommend it to anyone who has uh, endured in a relationship thank you, for Bob. quite a while. And uh, thank you so much for joining us in Mr. Media today. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. recorded live before a studio audience full of sexually frustrated women hoping either Dr. Snyder or me, Mr. Media, can cure what ails them in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Hi, this is Rich Scheidner. If you've ever wondered what it was like to be a stand-up comedian in the 1980s, I'm going to do you a big favor. Instead of billions of dollars for a time machine, you can just spend $24.95 and buy my new book, Kicking Through the Ashes, My Life as a Stand-Up in the 1980s Comedy Boom. It will save you money and give you thrills. It will take you there. Go to my website, richscheidner.com. Go to amazon.com and buy this book.